refine from there. You know they can get through the piece, then you can start refining, refining, then put it back together again. again. But find that time when, okay, now we've got to, we've broken it apart, we've, we've worked as much detail as possible, now let's start putting it back together. And I've had those where I've got, ah, I waited just too late. And it results in some sleepless nights. Fortunately, the kids, you know, have done well, but it's, um, that can be uneasy. If you say, I, I waited just a little bit too long on that. Ultimately, that's, that's our responsibility to understand this entire process of how long it will take your group, not over programming. You know, that is a challenge that we all face is we want, we want, to, we want to push our students, I think, to the limits, don't we? I do. I want to push them to the edge. I don't want to push them over the cliff, but I want to see what they can they can do. And it's finding that right mix of I've got five weeks, how far can we go in five weeks? What is too far, what is not far enough for them, then that we're not serving them well. Most groups that I adjudicate over program. So you can tell that 90% of their work has been on technique, rhythm, trying just trying to get the piece under the fingers and um, at the expense of expression and musicianship. So there's something to be said for kind of pushing them, but making sure that we're not going to spend 90% of our time just working the fingers and getting the thing put together and hoping by a rehearsal or two before the end that they can run it and they're hanging on for dear life. I've been in that situation. I don't know if you have been, but it's like, yeah, this was too hard and I didn't recognize it soon enough. I, I feel sorry for the kids when I adjudicate. It's just uh, they're giving it their all. It's just too much. Think about how far you can push your, your students. You're the expert. That, that's our responsibility. <clears throat> I think it's it's mindful to think about rehearsal basics and to properly attend to these. We want to make sure that we have an adequate number of parts. We've got folders for everyone in the band. We have to insist that our students keep a pencil in their folders and use them. I mentioned to Mr. Seifert after the first rehearsal with the Wind Symphony, I said, I love hearing the pencils click on the stands. And I find as I, I conduct more, I guess conduct more, <coughs> students don't use pencil. I remember I used to do pencil check, Milchu High School. Let me see your pencil. I want to see them. Raise them up. If you don't have a pencil, <coughs> take a lap around the building. I was old school. No, I didn't have to take a lap. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking in marching band outside. They would take a lap. I don't know if we can do that kind of thing today. That was kind of the era of push-ups, too. We won't talk about that. But they just, they just don't, they don't use pencils. And I, I continue to play as a trumpet player, and I make sure I've always got a pencil there. I can't remember everything I need to remember. Those habits start at home. They're not, not using a pencil just because they're at an honor band, because they don't do it at home. So make sure you're hearing those pencils click on the stands. The students are writing down uh, what you're, you're asking them to do. It makes everything so much more efficient. With the, okay, how many times have we talked about the key change at letter E going into D flat? How many of you want that? Make sure you insist upon that. Be sure that your music has an adequate number of rehearsal landmarks. Today, the music is set up, usually most measures are numbered, and it's, it's not a problem. But a lot of the classic pieces, the British band classics, the you know, Bon Williams folk song suite, notorious for having inadequate rehearsal landmarks. So go through and put some in, or have your students as you're rehearsing by form. Okay, let's designate this as letter A or letter B so you're not sitting there trying to find rehearsal landmarks or just require them like I do <coughs> number all your measures. Be sure you number the measures in your score. I learned that at Milshu High School because I had a score that wasn't numbered once. And kids said, yeah, what measure number is that? I got busted on that. <laughs> so, so I numbered all my measures and I turned really red about that. So, that just prevents frustration. It saves you time, and but you want to inspect the parts. Again, most of the parts today, Finale, Sibelius, you get every 10 numbered. It's a lot easier, but, but 
not every arrangement is like that. Be sure that you have all the equipment you personally need, all your scores, and I have one here with measures, number, smiley face, baton, pencil, if you use a whiteboard, have an eraser, I was talking with Mr. Seifert about that. We can't keep dry erasers in uh, our, at our whiteboards in Iowa, so I have a stash that I just take with me. You've got to make sure that, that you're prepared. Tuner, metronome, your stereo works, and all of that. Be sure that your rehearsal space is clean and organized. I don't know what your band rooms look like, but they need to be clean and professional. When students walk in, it needs to be a professional environment that, first of all, they feel safe and, and respected in, but it feels like, yes, this is an environment where I feel like this is going to be productive. Early in my teaching career, I took great pride in setting up my own band. The Oshu High School band room before the kids came in, I was setting up those chairs evenly spaced. If something was wrong with it, it was my fault. But when those kids came in, I wanted their chair and their stand ready to go and looking nice. At the end of the day, we would clear the floor and then I would start over in the morning. Now we have a work crew at Iowa and I'm very particular with them. These are undergrads that are getting great training in you know, the detail of how do you set up a formation. You, know, you give the flutes a little more space, you give your horns a little more room, not too much room back to front and, and things like that. But the, the mindset you want when those students come in is, okay, we're serious about what we're doing and it needs to look neat. You want to be sure that whatever's on the exterior, that it just looks nice. Marching percussion from the ball, they're in cases and stored and everything looks, again, very professional about that. You want that positive professional mood set for the, the rehearsal. A routine, I'm a routine advocate. I, I want to be sure that we have a routine that, that I and my students follow. That routine starts with personal preparation. This is where it gets really challenging. I wonder how much time you have before rehearsals to mentally prepare for your, your band rehearsal. I remember when I was at Monterey High School, um, First thing I would do every day is I would stack my scores on my desk. Because we'd have jazz band, we'd have um, the top group, we'd have all the bands through the day. And I remember basically going from one class, grabbing a set of store scores, having a rehearsal, coming back, putting those down, grab the jazz scores, going. I didn't have much time to mentally prepare for rehearsal. And I, I know the the image of the college band director is all we do is study scores all day long. That ain't the case. I have just as little time now um, as, as I did as a public school teacher, but I try to find a few minutes before my rehearsals to clear my mind, flush that faculty meeting that we just had that agitated everyone, or just, just find a way to find some quiet space and look through, okay, we're rehearsing this today, I need to get my head on. Because if I go into a rehearsal and I'm not focused, um, it's not effective. First of all, our, our students know immediately something's up. Something's not quite right. Something's bothering them. Things don't go well. Then I get mad because that is my foremost responsibility is to be an effective teacher, an inspiring teacher for those students. And I, I, I find that it's quite, there's quite a difference when I can have at least 30 minutes of quiet time to think through, okay, this is, yes, this is what we're going to do, this is what we did Monday, so this is what we need to do to have a really well-organized rehearsal. Those go so well compared to I'm running in from committee meeting, a lot of agitation, just grab the score and go, and I really don't have a great, I've planned everything sort of mentally, and it just, it never feels quite right. So. Try, do the best you can. Maybe you organize before the day gets started, but you, I think you need to think about, okay, what do we need to accomplish here? And it takes a, a little more time, at least it does for me, than as I'm, I've got the scores walking from my off office to the podium. So you want to develop a routine. I wish I had an hour and a half. That's the amount of time I really wish I had. It's almost impossible for me to get that. I'm, I'm fortunate if I can get 30 minutes. So I, I hope that, that you find a way to, to create that kind of routine into your preparation. Um, also, I think you want to think about how do you expect the students to enter the rehearsal room? I think this piece is important. What do you expect in terms of 
how they store their cases, their book bags. Do you talk about it? Is it important to you? For me, it all speaks to this idea of professionalism. I want the room to look nice. They can bring their cases in, but I don't want them sprawled out all over the room. We have designated areas for that, book bags off to the side. Um, how do you expect your students to warm up? This is a big one for me. When I'm, I'm coming into uh, the room, first of all, I expect everybody to be playing. No one should just be sitting. You, you go to an orchestra concert before the, the A is given, you know, the lights come down. Everybody on the stage is playing. They're either, you know, warming up on scales, slurs, or they're, they're playing excerpts from the music. So kids need to be playing and get, getting a good, quick warm up. Um, I insist that they warm up in the context of the rehearsal. So for the band rehearsal, I don't want to hear their favorite excerpt from Beethoven's Fifth or their favorite pet band chart. Don't want to hear it. Or their favorite concerto. I have nothing against any of that. When they're warming up for a jazz band rehearsal, they don't need to be playing Blue Shades. Well, that one almost works, right? <laughs> they don't need to be playing First Sweet Knee Flat. Do you see what I'm saying? And um, we have to talk about that and just say, you know, professionally, that's the expectation. If you're warming up um, Chicago Symphony Orchestra concert, you're probably not going to be blasting through the Artunian trumpet concerto. Just it's not quite right. But you're playing warm-ups, you're playing your excerpt. So what is your expectation? Are they playing favorite pet band excerpts, or are they in there and they're saying, okay, I need to look at this, I'm not playing this very well. You will set that expectation. So how do they enter the room? What do they do with their equipment? What do they do when they sit down? Are they playing at all? Or are they playing what you want them to be playing? Or scales, arpeggios, lip slurs, everything that you've taught them in terms of basics, but they need that helps um, set their mind for an effective rehearsal. And I do have to remind my students from time to time. I remember uh, I learned that from Jim Suttoth at Texas Tech. So I was in the trumpet section, and we were having our sort of a favorite concerto competition before band one day. So I'm playing the Hindemith trumpet sonata. It's one of my favorites. Somebody's playing the high, you know how trumpet players do, right? Well, I can play this one a little louder, a little <laughs> higher than you. And uh, Suttoth walked in and heard all that, and it wasn't nice. It was not nice. And uh, it's like, you know what? He's absolutely right. Absolutely. We shouldn't have been doing it. We were young and, and all of that. It's like, that's, that's right. And I think my students get that. And so it's just, it's up to me to, to remind them that they've got to be physically and mentally prepared for band rehearsal. When they go to pet band, then they're playing Let's Go Blue or whatever. That's, that's all great, Rocky. <laughs> Be sure you write your rehearsal order on the board. I think that's important. When they come in, um, you know, we start, I'll tell you kind of how we start rehearsals later, but we'll have the corral that we're doing. We'll have um, all of the pieces. And if we're going from A to C on this piece, this helps our percussionist. The percussion get a bit agitated at me if I just put a piece on and we're only going to rehearse a section where they don't have to bring out the lovely catalog of pieces. <laughs> and so I try to be sensitive to that wine dark scene. This was Ludwig catalog of pieces. I said I'll do my best to organize that so that you know what we're doing so you only have to bring out what we're going to rehearse. Um, but that, that helps them get set. Okay, we've got these pieces in order. If the students don't have their music in order when we're going, I get I get very disappointed at them, and I let them know that. If we're about to start the corral, and they start, I start seeing corral books coming out, it's not fun. It's just professional expectation. I take the time to put it on the board, get everything organized, and will will function very well. When will you begin and end the rehearsal? On time, or are you, are you someone who runs late? I advocate for being on time. Um, I even will start a minute or two early sometimes, but I, I don't start late. I do not end late. I think that one's especially disrespectful for students. Our students are extremely busy, just like yours. They, they have to get to another class. We end at 3 o'clock. I don't care if we're coming up on the grandest moment of Elsa's procession to the cathedral and we're just about there. 
it's three o'clock, I gotta let you go. And they just, they've gotta go. Well, if it's close, we might. Because <laughs> they want to, they want to play it. But you know what I'm saying, we just cannot, we can't do that. So what is your expectation? Do you come in late? Are you scrambling through scores? Hey, what are we gonna do today? It just doesn't work well. So you come in, boom, it's on the, the board. It sets a very different tone for the rehearsal. Uh, Eastern students, your rehearsals are like this, right? What I'm describing. On time, it sets a very professional atmosphere of what you're doing. So, I, I keep a watch, well I used to, in our new, we're in the second year of a new building, the clock in the Boxman, um, Boxman 2400, our large rehearsal room, is wisely at the back of the room. So I can see it, not there, Nothing's more discouraging to look at students and they, you know, and then they, their eyes go here to watch <laughs> But if you don't have a clock, you know, first of all, if it's here, I'd cover it. So they're not, they're not concerned about what time it is. When we were in our temporary facilities, I would put my phone on the ground so I could see it, so I could look down and see where we are. So I have, you know, again, you know, the warm up. I'll take about eight minutes on that, six to eight minutes, and then 20 minutes on this. 20. So I have to get through everything, I have everything broken down time-wise. Now I can look in the back of the room, but you want to set that up so that, that the students don't get distracted by you looking at the clock. Because if you pull out your phone to check and see what time it is, then they start checking, they get distracted. Oh, it's almost time for lunch or English or whatever. So you want to find a way to, to manage your time but so it's not distracting. I do not permit these in rehearsal at all. I removed the tuba player a couple of years ago because he had a he was checking his cell phone. You cannot do it. I know it's it's a struggle, isn't it? Everybody's everybody's wired in. I walked into the lobby the other day. There were eight symphony band students here. They were all on their devices. Nobody's talking to anybody. I let them have it. Great friends here. Why aren't, what are you all just texting each other? And, <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's the age, um, but you know, I kind of view our rehearsals as a, a bit of a sanctuary from the outside world. So I, I imagine some s sort of sneak this in. They just can't stand it, you know. But um, I, I don't tolerate having cell phones in rehearsal. How will you begin and end rehearsals? I think that's important. How, how do you do that? So you walk in, your rehearsal starts at 8.30. Is it musical? You start right away with long tones. You say, good morning. I think that, that's important. You start with announcements. You know, disseminating information is, is an important part of what we have to do. Maybe it's about a fundraising program, or you have a concert coming out. I mean, we have to give our students information. But I, I find that we have to, at least I do, I have to manage that really carefully for that, those short announcements suddenly have taken 10 minutes. And so my answer to that has been to just create some variety of how I dispense information. Sometimes, often, I'll just write the announcements on the board and I'll just say, be sure you check the announcements on the board on your way out. If it's something that's gonna take a little bit more care and attention, then I often will save that for the the very end of band, so I know, okay, I've left myself two minutes. I've got to have them out by three. So I have two minutes to, to get through this information. If I, I rarely start with announcements, because I know I've got an hour and a half. I take forever. Sometimes I'll put announcements in the middle. If we've had a, a pretty, our rehearsals tend to be pretty intense, but we get, you know, we're a pretty hard section. Hey, let's relax for a minute. I'm, I've got a couple things I'd like to give you. So they just, back off a little bit, relax. Here are some, some things I want to remind you about. Okay, now let's get back. So I, I don't have a, I do have sort of variety within a routine, but I will mix that up a little bit. I typically like to start musically. I will say good afternoon, try to, to look in their eyes. That's really important for me as I'm just checking in with my students, being sure they're okay. And we have good eye contact, and we will start with um, like at Remington, some long tones and things, and then we'll proceed from there. I try to get to the music as quickly as possible. Again, they're there to play. They want to play. They want to play. So I want to honor that. But 
think about how you want to handle your announcements. Some will do um, texting or email, utilizing technology. I think that's that's great. Um, but think about that. That can chew up. You imagine that if you, if you take five or ten minutes for announcements every rehearsal over five weeks, that's costly. How does the initial musical portion of your rehearsal begin? Do you start with long tones or some kind of scale? Uh, do you start with a, a tuning pitch? Do you have a, a routine? So again, I think it's important that there's some consistency in, in what you do. I I start with some kind of long tone. So I want to get I want to get the students thinking about air. Sometimes we'll we'll do some breathing exercises from the breathing gym. There's some really nice exercises that in there that work for full ensemble. There's some that are pretty complicated in there, so I usually extract the easier ones. So we may we may stand and just do some breathing exercises have them sit, but we'll do non-notated long tone. I want us communicating. I, I want, maybe we'll go through, let's take a low concert F scale as I give you each note. I'm monitoring their breathing, their sound production. I'm making sure, like you are, I'm, we're making eye contact. That's an important part of just checking in with students, but I don't want them in a, in a method book worried about a lot of really technical passages at this point. The long tones, no, the sound's not there. Go back, reinforce some things. We'll do a scale and a round, establishing um, our baseline balance. We'll tune after that, um, and then go into some kind of corral. So I would, I would vary, I vary the scale. We do majors, we do minors, we'll do thirds, we'll do fourths. I mean, I, I want to keep them engaged, so I, I mix it up.